Welcome back. In the previous presentation, hopefully you got a sense of the enormity of the challenge posed by big data. How do we process such huge amounts of data? As you probably suspect, our traditional algorithms, our traditional sorting and searching algorithms, aren't going to work. What we're going to have to look at are ways to distribute the data and process it in parallel. Let's have a look at these modern approaches. Let's start by looking at some of the traditional data processing techniques, techniques that work fine for moderately sized sets of data. Well, we've talked about sorting and searching earlier. One of the problems of the algorithms we looked at is that to, in order to work, all the data that's being sorted or searched has to fit into the main memory, into RAM, random access memory. Similarly, the data in these algorithms are processed sequentially not in parallel, which, as we're going to see in a moment, is necessary for processing large data sets. So sorting and searching in the traditional way that we talked about isn't going to work on some of the large data sets. Another traditional way to process data is to use spreadsheets. It's for example, Excel spreadsheets. In this case, you're talking about data that are structured into columns and rows. This is for moderate and, uh, and even large data sets, so for example, Excel can process 50 megabytes, but with certain configurations, you can process up to two gigabytes in a, an Excel spreadsheet. And this gives us access to analysis tools and visualization tools. So like spreadsheets in general are very nice software products for, for processing and visualizing data. While this two gigabytes limit is a lot of data, it's small in comparison to the terabyte and petabyte size data sets that make up the big data challenge. So spreadsheets aren't going to work for those types of data sets. Similarly, databases. In this case, the data are structured into tables that can be interrelated. So you can search logically for data and retrieve things like find all males above 65 in the state of Connecticut. And this also is for moderate to large data sets, 2 gigabytes to up to 2 terabytes, using MySQL, a popular free and open source database management system. But again, while the 2 terabyte limit here is a big number, it's still dwarfed by the size of some of the data sets that make up the big data challenge. Another software tool that's just recently emerged are Google Fusion Tables. These are provided as a free web service, and they provide similar features as a spreadsheet. You can use them for analyzing data, also for visualizing data, including uh, via geographical maps. And they're very easy to use, as we're going to see in an, in an upcoming exercise. So none of these traditional approaches will work. And that leaves us with the question, how do you process really large data sets? And by really large, we mean on the order of a petabyte. 10 to the 15 bytes of data. That's a number that looks like this, 10 cubed multiplied by itself five times. And as you, as you know, that's way too large of a data set to fit into a computer's memory. In fact, such a data set would take up many, many disk drives. A one petabyte data set would occupy 1,000 one terabyte disk drives or 10,100 gigabyte drives. So traditional approaches aren't going to work. What we're going to look at is the MapReduce model. This is a programming model that was developed for processing large data sets. It uses a distributed file system so that a data set of size 1 petabyte would be broken up and stored in files that are spread out over many computers. And it would use a parallel algorithm, that is, many identical processors running the same process simultaneously. MapReduce was first developed at Google, but has since been released as an open source platform known as Hadoop. Here's a, the results of or several experiments that were performed on the problem of sorting a one petabyte data set. Google was able to sort it in six hours, Yahoo 16 hours, Quantcast seven hours, so they all took around the same amount of time. But look at the number of machines involved. Google required 4,000 computers and 48,000 disk drives. Yahoo, 3,800 computers, 15,000 disk drives. Quantcast is promoting their approach because it uses fewer machines and fewer disk drives, but still, we're talking about a lot of computers and a lot of disk drives working on the one problem of sorting this one petabyte data set. 
let's take a look at how MapReduce works. And we're going to look at a, an example that's frequently used to explain the MapReduce model. Imagine the problem of counting the occurrences of every word in a large data set of documents, where you have, say, n documents. The first document perhaps contains the words, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. The second, in for a penny, in for a pound. So if you counted all the letter, all the words A off, there's one, two, three, four, five in just these two documents, okay? Imagine there's a petabyte of data stored in the document. The algorithm is very simple. The MapReduce algorithm proceeds in two phases. In the first step, or the first phase, for each word in the documents, we output a partial count. So every time we see the word A, we're going to output A and 1. Every time we see the word man, we're going to output man in one. This is known as the map step. We're mapping the word a, uh, or the word w in general, to w1. Okay, and we do that for every word. When the map phase is finished, we, we proceed to the reduce phase. And in this case, we're going to count up all these partial counts that the map phase generated. So we start with our sum equal to zero. And for each partial count, we add it to the sum. So this, as you can see, is, a, is basically a linear algorithm for the portion of the document set computer would be working on. So let's see how the MapReduce algorithm would process these n documents constituting one petabyte of data. We can assume that the data are already distributed across the 48,000 disk drives. The first thing that would be done is one computer out of the ones that are going to be working on this problem in parallel will be designated the master. It's the master's job to control the process. The first thing the master does is it designates a bunch of computers to serve as the mappers. And there may be M mappers, let's say. And each mapper is given the task of mapping a portion of the data set into these partial counts. So, For example, maybe mapper 1 is given a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Mas mapper 2 or mapper M is given in for a penny, in for a pound, and so forth. These mappers output partial counts. So for example, if this mapper 1 was given this piece of text, it would output these partial counts for the word A. It would also output counts for plan and man and the other words. We're not showing all of the output it would produce. Similarly, this mapper would produce partial counts for in and for and the other words in its portion of the document. When the map phase is done, the master designates another collection of computers to serve as reducers. These are given the partial counts as their inputs, and they add them up. So for example, reducer 2 is given these five partial counts, and it reduces them down to this one count. And so that's how the results are produced. After the sum is produced, the MapReduce system outputs the results. And, and as you can see, there's five occurrences of A, two of four, and so forth. So to summarize, the MapReduce algorithm is based on the idea of distributing the data sets over many, many disk drives, and then distributing the process over many computers, where each computer is operating in parallel on a portion of the data set. So as you see, the MapReduce algorithm is an effective way to process large data sets that are distributed over many disk drives. And in the next presentation, we're going to see examples of how it's used to solve different kinds of problems. But we're going to pause here and work on an exercise before proceeding.